The first speaker today is uh, Theo, who will give us a nice dance and uh, talk about musicians' synchronization and the mystery of swinging jazz. Theo Geisel from Göttingen, please. Okay. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me like this? Okay. So, synchronization, our conference here is full of talks about synchronization. Swarmulator's uh, synchronization of uh, many things, uh, of metronomes. Other people are working on synchronization of fireflies. I have worked uh, for 30 years at least on the synchronization of neurons. So why not study synchronization of humans? And uh, perhaps in a situation where everybody thinks it's most important uh, where, when humans perform music together. Um, so that's uh, what I've done, among many other things, of course, <laughs> in, in physics, uh, in the last uh, 10 years or even more. And uh, in particular, this synchronization turns out to be kind of very relevant for something that's called swing. And it's actually still a mystery, uh, a little less now, but uh, it's a real mystery. And you will see, and it will turn out to be relevant. Synchronization will be relevant for this question. Uh, so let me first mention my co-workers, uh, Corentin Nelias and George Datzeris, uh, both uh, former graduate students, and Viola Priesemann, uh, who was a postdoc at that time in my group. Uh, and we are at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization in Göttingen at the Bernstein Center for Computational Neuroscience, um, as well as the University of Göttingen. Uh, so let me give you, a, give you a short introduction on synchronization in music uh, from a scientific perspective. Um, we've studied this um, in different settings, uh, so that was more than a decade ago. Um, the simplest uh, synchronization is when a musician tries to synchronize with a metronome, uh, and we've studied this in a simple and more complex setting. Uh, like here in this uh, example is just a, a percussionist following, actually th this one was from Ghana. Um, so he, following uh, uh, the beats of a, of a metronome. And we measured the uh, deviations uh, from the metronome in milliseconds here for a thousand successive beats on the drum. And so you see it looks random uh, and it actually looks self-similar. So you would expect something like scaling laws and uh, well, pink noise actually, it's what you find. So one over F noise. Um, more, uh, a little later, my former graduate student, Holger Hennig here, who's on, on these papers, was a little faster than I. Uh, when he was a, a, a postdoc in Harvard, he um, also for other things, but he, he managed to get uh, a MIDI piano in the music department across the street and uh, musicians who tried to synchronize uh, without a metronome, playing together a simple note. And uh, so he could see uh, the lead, leader-follower relations, uh, who's leading and who's following uh, in, in, uh, in the time series. And typically what you find is sketched here. Uh, <clears throat> when musicians play with a metronome, this shows the power, spectr uh, power spectral density uh, of the interbeat intervals. It's not the the deviations from a metronome, but it's the interbeat intervals, but played with a metronome. So it typically gives such a power law, this is log log, uh, slope one in this case. And this actually reflects one over F noise. Doesn't look like, of course, it's an increasing power law here, but that's because you look at 
you look at the interbeat intervals and not at the deviations directly. Um, uh, not a very important question. So that's where the metronome. Now when uh, musicians play or people play without a metronome, you still find this branch here reflecting 1 over f nose, but you find an, addition, an additional branch. The spectrum is V-shaped, and uh, so here they are playing without a metronome. Uh, they have an internal clock that replaces uh, the metronome. So this, which is absent here, so this part reflects the fluctuations of the internal clock, although we we don't really know how this internal clock works. I mean, there are theories by psychologists, but it's not the same type of theory that we would do as uh, physicists uh, to, I mean, to verify with uh, experiments. Um, one co can go a step uh, further and that was done by a colleague of mine from the Max Planck Society in Berlin, in this case, Ullmann Lindenberger and his co-workers. Uh, they tried to look into the brains of uh, musicians when they played together here uh, in a guitar duet, and they found uh, synchronization, intra-brain and even inter-brain synchronization. More exactly, they saw a phase locking, a phase difference uh, locked, uh, in the EEG delta band. So delta band is very low frequency. Uh, and so this uh, phase locking was modulated depending on the leader-follower relation. That is, uh, the, the leader is always a little ahead uh, in, in, the, in the EEG, not, not <laughs> yeah? And, and the follower uh, uh, is slightly phase shifted behind. Uh, so there's still lots of things to, to understand. But of course, one can ask what are the neuronal mechanisms behind that. Um, I don't have a, a really uh, definitive answer, but maybe it's, it's related to a neuronal mechanism that we found in a, in a different setting, uh, namely in uh, when we studied uh, selective attention. Uh, in selective attention, imagine uh, you pay attention to something and information is flowing from one brain area to another brain area, the red one here. Now, if you shift your attention to something else, then uh, information must flow from a different brain area uh, to the red area, so like, like as is sketched here. So th this information flow must be, uh, must be gated very rapidly in, in a few milliseconds. And uh, so how, how can this be done? How can information flow be, be gated uh, in different uh, ro routes? Uh, and the dynamical mechanism which we found in, in, in realistic simulations here, um, when, so we, we, uh, we considered three brain areas uh, that were coupled excitatorily within the areas, uh, also inhibitory connection, uh, using one uh, Buzaki neurons um, with, uh, with a delay in, 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 uh, in, the, trans in the transport here. Um, so in these uh, simulations, we found such oscillations in the gamma band, which is uh, higher frequency, uh, oscillations, transient oscillations in the gamma band that were, that were synchronized. Uh, and uh, the phase difference, and there were phase differences between these, and the phase differences determine uh, which information can flow. Uh, so whether information flows like this or like this. Uh, for instance, when the blue si signal is uh, ahead of the, of the brown signal, then uh, we saw that the mutual information uh, wa was finite at some uh, time delay, while the mutual information for the brown signal along this 
uh, direction was, uh, was more or less zero. And uh, when uh, the phase difference shifted and the brown signal was uh, slightly earlier, um, then the brown signal could transport the mutual information. Uh, and the blue, uh, the blue di uh, direction here did not transport any information. Uh, we also um, measured this in the uh, transfer entropy. But uh, it would lead too, too far uh, to go into more details. Let me get to my things that interest me most and that have actually uh, occupied my mind for the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, whether we could understand the so-called swing field uh, using our th scientific methods. What is the swing field? Well, it's uh, even Louis Armstrong asked this. What is this thing called swing? He should have known. I mean, it was uh, almost 100 years ago. Um, and he was one of the main uh, jazz soloists of the time. So what is it? But uh, also, it's important. Like Duke Ellington uh, said in a song, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. But what does it mean? Uh, don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. This is not what it means. So um, to, make, to make clear uh, swing, when I talk about swing, I don't mean the swing era or the swing style. This is something that was in the 30s and 40s and maybe a little later of the last century. Uh, um, uh, Benny Goodman, Henry, not Henry Miller, what was his name? <laughs> I forgot. Benny Goodman and, and other people who played a, a certain big band style, uh, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, and so on. Um, this is not all, what is meant here. Swing is much more general in jazz, and it plays a role for all uh, styles in jazz, and is required, actually. Uh, so it's when musicians say it swings or it doesn't swing. If a, you have a performance, uh, you listen to a band, and the band swings or it doesn't. But what does it mean? Uh, that's not so clear. That's what's meant, so a certain feeling that you get when you hear a performance or that you don't get. Uh, so what is it? Guti Williams, a trumpet player, uh, said when he was asked to describe it, I'd rather tackle Einstein's theory. Uh, and Bill Treadwell, a little later, who wrote the big book of swing, said you can feel it, but you just can't explain it. And this was actually a standard opinion, and it was written in similar ways in, in, in various books. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so we, in, in one of our previous studies uh, some years ago, four years ago, we asked the participants, uh, professional jazz musicians and semi-professional jazz musicians, to tell us what they think. And here are the answers. What do you think makes a piece of music swing? Uh, these are the answers that were given. So you, you see, it's a mess. They, they don't agree. You find all kinds of answers here. Even the professional jazz musicians don't agree. So there was a need to, to understand this. Oops. Uh, Let's look at the new Harvard Dictionary of Music uh, and its definition. So the definition here is swing is an intangible rhythmic momentum in jazz. Swing defies analysis, uh, which is also another definition as we would like to have it. Uh, well, there's a little uh, more here, which I put in small print. Let me magnify this, an intangible rhythmic momentum in jazz specifically manifested in a variety of relationships between long and short notes. What is meant by that? Well, uh, 
relationship node nodes are unequal subdivisions of quarter nodes. You have a quarter node, you divide it in, in half, in two pieces actually, but you don't divide it equally in eighth and eighth, but uh, in one piece that is a little longer, so unequally, uh, and another piece that is a little shorter, and you call this downbeats and offbeats, and there is a swing ratio which measures the, the length ratio of the downbeats to the offbeats. If this looks a little complicated, I have a, a, an interactive tool on my website where you can try to understand this. Uh, so uh, here is a, a slider where you can shift the swing ratio from one to two to three and so on. And here uh, you see a, a musical uh, score, uh, which shows you how this changes well, immediately, uh, so you can see it. Uh, you find it on my website here, uh, or, or go to my homepage and, and then go further. Oops, what is this? Uh, okay, so uh, here on the bottom of my home page you find this musical score. What is the swing ratio? If you go there, uh, connection is not very good. <laughs> Well, it's not, well, how do we got down here? Oh, down here it is. Okay, here we go. This is <laughs> high speed internet. That's actually, a, well. Uh, so here you're told, please shift the slider to change the swing ratio. Uh, so not to forget it, here's the slider. Okay. It's a swing ratio of one, and here you hear a certain piece. Uh, um, okay. Uh, you know, it's, this should be uh, an A flat, and this should be an A. Okay, let's listen to that. Swing ratio one. So, uh, there is a succession of downbeats and offbeat and downbeat and offbeat. And on the time axis here you see both are equally long. That is swing ratio equal one. Now let's change this, for instance, so that you hear the difference. Let's put it to three. Usually this Western musical score is would be punctuated uh, notes here. Uh, so, but we change this in a somewhat inconventional in conventional way here, you see. Uh, so we have uh, downbeats three times as long as the offbeats. Let's listen to that. Good. Uh, but this is not swinging. Uh, the standard uh, view is that jazz musicians should play a, with a ternary feel, it is called. Uh, uh, so a swing ratio two to one. So twice as long as this. This is like triplets. Let's listen to that. This is already much better uh, and it's what, what musicians say um, and music teachers tell you how to play jazz, but actually it's a little too too large for my taste and others' tastes. Uh, here, this is 1.61. By chance, the golden mean, but doesn't mean anything. Uh, <laughs> so this is about how I would. Uh, use a, a swing ratio 
if I was to play this. And um, yeah. Less than one, uh, less than one occurs in, not really in, in sw swinging music, but uh, more in, sometimes in kind of funk music, uh, work. Yes. Does it play to the lower one? Is there a demo? Uh, I, th I don't think it's possible. I, I think we, no, I think we end with one. Right. No, I, I'm sure it. Ah, here we go. Okay. Uh, you wouldn't do this in, in swing, right? and, and you wouldn't play it straight like that, except at high speeds. But uh, we will get to that. So this is, this is uh, an important ingredient of swing music, and amateur music, uh, laypersons uh, often think this is swing, and this is it. This is all you need in swing. A computer can do this without any problem, but it's not. And uh, of course, any professional jazz musicians or a jazz musician feels that this is not sufficient. Let's go back. So, uh, let's listen uh, to an example. So you can hear the swing ratio already. So this is definitely swinging, and you hear Okay, um, maybe you got a feeling for the complexity of this phenomenon. Um, so let's look at some approaches, scientific approaches. Um, um, later on, so about 50 years ago, uh, a little earlier than that, Charles Kyle, a, a musicologist, actually uh, an ethnomusicologist, an American, uh, and a drummer also, uh, <laughs> he suggested that Swing is created by little discrepancies within a jazz drummer's beat between bass and drums, between rhythm section and soloists. So uh, these discrepancies we saw already in, 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 in the beginning, uh, drummers following a metronome. Uh, this was suggested as uh, the origin of swing, uh, but it was considered very um, controversially and he left unclear which kind of discrepancies he meant. Uh, this is also ca called micro-timing deviations. Uh, but in any case, uh, this hypothesis challenges the notion of perfect synchronization. If, if it's uh, discrepancies between the timing of different musicians uh, that create swing, uh, there is something wrong with synchronization. Uh, and the question is, to which extent do jazz musicians synchronize or desynchronize their timing in their performances, and uh, which phase shifts do they use? Uh, so the literature, as I said, is controversial uh, since this uh, suggestions. Uh, and uh, so in our approach, uh, we used uh, data an analytics, uh, for instance, time series analysis uh, of the micro-timing deviations um, 
and also more general timing analysis of 456 full jazz solos uh, that we based on the Weimar Jazz database. Uh, another part was perception experiments with, where we manipulated the timing to prove or disprove that uh, these micro-timing deviations contribute to swing. Uh, we used this uh, Weimar Jazz database, a transcription into musical scores and to a, into the MIDI format, a digital format of 456 jazz solos. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the MIDI format also gives you the onset timing of, uh, of the notes of the different instruments, of, of the soloists in this case. And here are uh, the first results. Uh, we measured the swing ratio, the mean swing ratio over a solo, uh, 456 different solos uh, as a function of tempo. And so we see a trend here. Um, but in particular, um, I just told you about the swing ratio two, uh, the triplet feel, the well uh, <laughs> celebrated triplet feel of musicians. Only one soloist used the, the, this uh, swing ra ratio of two. Uh, all others are using smaller swing ratios. So that's what I said. I, my feeling is uh, it should be smaller. And Okay, that's one result. But let's look at these micro-timing deviations. Uh, do they deviate? It's shown here uh, uh, deviations in milliseconds. Uh, as you see, uh, they are actually all delayed. So these are the downbeat delays, the, the, the deviations on the downbeats of the soloist, deviations from the rhythm section, uh, and they are all delayed. There are no uh, uh, anticipated downbeats and of the order of 50 milliseconds or less here. In the intermediate range, there are about uh, 35 milliseconds or so. And uh, only very few have a negative delay here, a sl slightly negative delay or, or zero. And um, almost all of them have positive delays and these delays decrease for extremely high tempos here. This is, uh, forget about this, this is just in relative time units, so-called ticks. Uh, this is MIDI language. Uh, so a majority of jazz soloists use downbeat delays with respect to the rhythm group. Um, but does this tell us something about swing? We don't know. We don't know. We, we found, find something. We don't know whether this is related to swing. Maybe they didn't even swing. Or there can be many reasons for, uh, for finding such delays. Uh, maybe they are not accurate enough. Maybe they had alcohol the night before, or what, like uh, some beers in a club. Uh, there are many reasons, but it, you, you cannot conclude that uh, these downbeat delays uh, play a role for swing. Um, so is there a way to, oh, I should mention, we did not measure any deviations on the offbeats for a particular reason that the off, the off, we can measure the offbeats, but we don't have the offbeats of the rhythm section, so we, we cannot uh, measure any deviations. That's unclear. It's not clear whether they have delays on the offbeats or not. Okay. But so is there a way to prove that the micro timing deviations contribute substantially to the swing feel? Yes, there is if we use uh, this approach here, which I uh, invented about five, six years ago. In, uh, so we use an operational definition, which means we measure the swing feel through expert ratings, uh, professional jazz musicians, uh, and we manipulate the micro timing in different ways. The answer is yes and no. Uh, and you will see this. Our first experiment, uh, which was done with these people here, we used uh, all random microtiming deviations uh, that are present in any performance. So involuntary random fluctuations uh, that must be present everywhere. So we asked, are these responsible for the swing field? We created fake recordings where we manipulated the micro-timing deviations in various ways. So like this here, um, 
this shows the time axis, downbeats and offbeats. And uh, so in the original, imagine we have a delay, uh, what, a deviation, di. Uh, we manipulate this multiplying by a factor of uh, two. So we get uh, double delays. Uh, um, this is called quantized multiplying by zero, so you delete any deviations. And we also inverted them, multiplying by minus one. And we did this for downbeats and offbeats. Yes. Okay. So these are 14, um, uh, 14 pieces. We used 12 of them. Uh, the participants had to first answer a questionnaire, extended questionnaire, the Goldsmith Musical Sophistication Index, uh, after which we classified them into different groups, professionals, semi-professionals, and so on. And they could rate, they had to answer different questions for each piece. In particular, did it swing? And this could be rated on a scale from one to four. Uh, not at all to very much. And here are the results. Um, so we had, uh, yeah, the quantized, uh, the original is here. The quantized without any deviations is here. The exaggerated microtiming deviations and the inverted microtiming deviations. Dark colors uh, are high ratings. So, uh, and Light colors are low ratings. What you see here is uh, the quantized, when you look, for instance, at the two highest ratings, uh, this line here, the quantized has the highest rating without any deviations. The original is rated slightly, uh, 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 slightly not as, as good, and the exaggerated is not rated well at all. Inverted is also not so good. Uh, so that means um, these microtiming deviations, involuntary deviations, do not play a role for the swing field. But uh, maybe if these were random deviations, if we use systematic microtiming deviations, maybe they play a role. So in a more recent uh, work experiment, which took us four years to carry out, uh, it's very tedious, I can tell you, uh, published last fall, uh, we used systematic deviations. So here, imagine downbeat, offbeat, and the next downbeat. Uh, there is a rhythm group, a rhythm section, which is quantized. So they fall on a metronome beat. Uh, and a performing pianist played with deviations, okay? Now, in the first step, we quantized the pianist also. We deleted any uh, deviations, so we used the quantized original as a starting point. We ate all uh, notes, uh, downbeats and offbeats, of the, uh, of the pianist by the same amount, 85 ticks or 35 milliseconds. I was guessing that uh, that this uh, would get the highest swing ratings. Uh, but then we also used the case where only the downbeats were delayed. Okay, the offbeats in synchrony with the rhythm section and the next downbeat again delayed. Uh, there are some details which I have to skip. Uh, so uh, I skipped this example also uh, since the... Okay, here are the results. Um, so today we're for the first time in time. Uh, here you see the, the different uh, conditions. Here are the results. Uh, now the highest ratings are in blue, the low ratings are in gray. What you see is that the downbeat delayed version gets the really highest ratings. Uh, whereas the quantized original gets much lower ratings, and the same is true for the both delayed uh, manipulation. So that tells us that 
uh, if you delay the downbeats and not the offbeats of a soloist with respect to a rhythm group, you get a much stronger swing feel as rated in this case by only professional and semi-professional jazz musicians. Okay, since uh, I don't have time anymore, I have to skip through the uh, statistical tests uh, without going into details. Uh, uh, if you want to have details, look it up on, our, on my website and in our paper. The receiver operating characteristics tells us uh, musicians were able to discriminate uh, the different pieces and the results were significant. The area under the curve has a significant number. Uh, this is one of the things. Results of an ordinal logistic regression uh, tell us that the odds ratio uh, is 7.5 for the downbeat delayed with a quantized or versus quantized original condition. Uh, so it means 7.5 times more probable that the downbeat delayed version is rated as swinging than the quantized original. And here a highly sig significant p number, p value. Uh, uh, we checked the robustness with respect to the sample size. Was our sample size sufficiently large? Uh, <clears throat> when you look at this, you see that about 20 uh, participants would have been sufficient. We had 37 uh, musicians participating. So it is uh, the sample size was really large enough. And finally, could have outliers affected the, the results? Uh, the answer is no, and this is... Uh, here in the estimated uh, beta coefficients of the logistic regression. Uh, there's no time to go into details. I thank you for your attention, and I thank you, <coughs> I thank the chairman for his patience. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you, you, Theo. Thank you very much.